Hello, and welcome to the first ever installment of Holy Highlights. This is a weekly, for at least as long as our cultural quarantine lasts, and then maybe even longer, interview show focused on reflecting on Sunday's sermon. Joining me via Zoom is Paul Mills, pastor at Marysville Church of the Nazarene. Say, say hello, Paul. Hello, how are you guys doing? The goal of these weekly videos is to plunge a little deeper into each week's sermons. I suspect that most congregations don't realize this, but pastors come up with a lot of ideas and concepts for each Sunday sermon, with a lot of material inevitably being left on the editing room floor. So this series is a way of exploring some of those ideas that get left behind. It's also a great time to hear from a trusted colleague and brother in Christ as he reflects on the sermon. It will be a, a good opportunity for me to, to hear how my colleagues are receiving it and, and what they find interesting. So, Paul, I think I'm ready for your questions or any of your thoughts regarding this past Sunday's sermon. Great. Um, you know, I really enjoyed the sermon. Uh, you know, as pastors, we don't get to see a lot of sermons. We, we tend to preach most of them. I'm just curious, the, the different format with the videoing and doing it that way, how, how's that work? How, have you enjoyed it? How, what, what shifts have you had to make? Oh, so yeah, uh, so many shifts. Uh, so this is our second week of doing video worship. And the, the first week, um, we filmed it straight, not in front of a live studio audience, as it were. <laughs> Um, but we just, we filmed it straight and we only had like two breaks in there where like, uh, we were going to do a bit of like a, a set change. So we do a children's sermon as a lot of churches do. And I wanted to do that down on the steps, um, the chancel. And we didn't think we could like make the camera move smoothly enough. Um, we're still kind of a rudimentary, uh, set up. And so we just cut and then we filmed down there later. Um, this past week, uh, my videographer, who's just a, uh, a congregant and a volunteer, AJ, been doing a magnificent job, yeah, that's uh, good. he requested that I break even my sermon up into segments. Hmm. Uh, and so that was weird. Like I wrote it as a whole, but then I would do like, you know, two or three pages of it and then we'd pause and cut and he was able then to, to stitch it together and make it look pretty seamless. Yes, he did. Yeah. So, but filming a sermon and snippets, uh, that was weird. Uh, that was weird. Not even bad weird. Um, there were definitely parts I liked. I was able to kind of like look at what was coming up next a little bit more carefully and, and sort of internalize it. Cause I'm a manuscript preacher. Uh, are you, or are you kind of from the cuff guy, aren't you? Yeah. Well, yeah. Not, I have extensive notes and, and sometimes that I stick pretty close to them. And uh, most of the time I stick pretty close, because if I don't, I get too too long. <laughs> right. That's what I always tell people. They're like, why do you use a manuscript? Like, it's not it's not because uh, I couldn't go up there and preach it without. It's because the sermon would double in length. Uh, right. uh, so, yeah, no, I, I like the format. And then AJ has been integrating fun additional video, you know, just some of the 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 cats scared by cucumbers over my right shoulder. Uh, right. He threw that in there because he knew I was trying to be funny at that moment. And right. this moment are in the third. And that was that was interesting. Transitions. How did it affect your transitions um, when when you had the the breaks? Did it, did it make it easier to do the transitions or harder? Um, it's well rhetorically, it's a lot easier, right? Like you don't you don't have to finesse the words just right to make sure folks are following you logically. Uh, especially the, the two different video inserts, the both of them being rather comedic of my dog and then right. my love of uh, s'more Girl Scout cookies. Right. Um, those were those were kind of like resets. Like when we came out of those, it was like beginning again rather right. than trying to do a smooth transition. So do you I use like, videos like that all the time? Is that is that was that common or is that something you included that you typically would not have used? Using videos, no. And some of that's, uh, you know, our church, like a lot of churches, are still sort of increasing our technology and increasing our capacities. I would be uh, wary of trying to integrate a video in the middle of a sermon for fear of like me pushing the button and it's not playing. And, you know, and then people are like, cool, I can check my phone. It's been quiet for more than five seconds. Uh, right. right. 
Uh, but I do use slides, still images. I use a lot of still images and sermons. Uh, and I've been doing that uh, a little over two years now. And that's been great. It allows some, often some levity, uh, but also some profundity. Um, and then also sometimes just being able to get a particular Bible passage up on the screen and highlight certain texts that you really want to draw people's attention to. So now we're swapping out videos for still images while we're kind of on this COVID-19 quarantine. Right. That's good. Now you're, you've been in the Lord's prayer. How long, how many weeks you've been in the Lord's prayer? Yeah. Started the first Sunday of March, uh, first Sunday of Lent. And the plan was to, to break it into its five segments and then have Holy Week, Palm Sunday to Easter as a standalone uh, and so, yeah, we're now four fifths of the way through. That's that was awesome. I really enjoyed at least the the, the portion I heard. I didn't listen to the other ones, uh, but I listened to this week's. I well, of course, the other ones weren't available like this. Are you are you online? Do you stream online? We uh, so right now you could see uh, the third and the fourth clause, uh, which was "Give us this day." And um, uh, <laughs> what did I preach this past Sunday? Uh, Lead us not to temptation. Ah, there it is. Yeah, my goodness. Well, I'm already looking to the next one. Um, right. You could get those two on YouTube. We we do record sermons. Again, it's a tech thing. We've been working on streamlining that system that we can get them rendered and uploaded more quickly. But I don't think you could find the first two weeks online, unfortunately. Okay. Um, though if my secretary is watching this, uh, she knows that I'm going to be calling her soon to be like, hey. You need to do this, and it's because of Paul Mills. Yeah, it's my fault. Blame yeah, me. Yeah, that's that's what I'm gonna do. I have to keep I have to keep her happy. She's great. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hang you out to dry, Paul. That's good. That's fine. Now you, you started the the lead me, which was a fascinating. I I had never thought about it in this way, but you began to deal with the lead me not the temptation with the ideal of leadership, uh, and and really talked about the use your clip of your dog that was hey. was not very led very easily. Um, I, I think that's a, an important thing. In, in the church, we talk about um, we're leaders that are supposed to develop leaders. What I think really the call of the Bible is to develop followers. Uh, right. so, so with that understanding, how do you think, does, does this passage help us understand what true leadership is? Um. That's a great question. I don't know if we we understand in this particular portion of the Lord's Prayer what true leadership is. Um, well, no. I mean, I think I think the whole thing is premised upon a God who has been, is, and will be leading us. Mm -hmm. And I think what it does is it redirects what our understanding of leadership is, and we can't understand leadership. Uh, for what it truly is and what it's meant to be until we at least begin to broach followership. Uh, and probably ideally we need to perfect followership to understand leadership. Um, I just think uh, like I was, I focused so much on that aspect of leadership because uh, I think we pray, you know, all of the Lord's prayer pretty cavalierly because we've memorized it and it's rote. And there's something good about having memorized something and it's deep in your soul. But then if you cease to remember what those words mean, that can be really problematic, right? right. Um, and so if we're really praying, lead us, that's a pretty clear indication of who we're supposed to be in the process. Um, and I, don't, I think we pray, lead us, and then we turn around and we try to grab hold of our lives every single day. Mm. That's good. So, so, so you're, you suggest that... Um even though we pray that, we don't live that. <laughs> yeah, to a degree. And so, I mean, the nice thing about going through this Lord's Prayer, like bit by bit, bite by bite, is it, it creates the time and the space to really try to reflect on what do we mean when we say lead us? And, and what, other, what are good examples of leadership we have out there? What are atrocious ones like my puppy Brutus? Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, well, not leadership, but fellowship. And I think it begins to inspire our imagination a little bit better for us to understand better what it means to pray that prayer authentically and to try to become the sort of followers who, who really mean it when we say lead us. 
and, and, I, and I like that the, the way you're you're approaching this. I think some would would take this passage, lead us not to temptation, to the to the extent that we're why would God lead us into temptation? Why why do we have to ask God not to lead us into temptation? But but I think from from your sermon and our discussion, what you're suggesting is uh, th this prayer is not for God to do something, but for us to recognize that God wants to lead us somewhere. Right. And, and, and an acceptance of his leadership. Um, I really but, did. I really did love the, the Exodus passage. And I didn't get to spend as much time in unpacking that story of, of God leading uh, Israel out of Egypt and putting a pillar of smoke before him in the day and a pillar of fire before him in the night. And um, I mean, by the way, they're walking day and night and this is presented as favorably, you know, yes. like, I have a friend, Josh, who does ultra marathon, so he runs day and night sometimes, right. and I don't think he's a crazy person, but the way the text presents this is, it's not, look how cruel this God is who took us from a one slave master to become another, but rather the imagery is like, whether we're waking or sleeping, our God has a point and purpose for us, mm -hmm. um, and and our goal is to just kind of follow in line with, with mm -hmm. that, and that's a deeply reassuring message, yes. uh, I think. And so, so the point of, uh, as your perspective here in the sermon is that it, it's not that the leadership's not there at all times, but the point is make us aware of your leadership from temptation. Yeah. Am, I, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, I would, I would think so. Um, you know, and <laughs> Maybe I did the prayer a small disservice by by focusing as much as I did on the lead us portion um, uh, initially and sort of divorcing it from the from temptation aspect. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the reason I did that was to help us redefine temptation in terms of our desire to assume control over our own lives, um, our desire to you know, uh, seek out other uh, forms of leadership in our lives, like um, submitting uh, as followers to where God is taking us. Mm -hmm. And the real temptation is to, to stop doing that and to reassume and reassert control over our own lives. Well, that's, I think that's an awesome observation. <laughs> and, and, you, and the truth is most of the time in the Bible, uh, you know, we, we get caught up in acts and actions and, and solitary moments. Uh, the, the Bible seems to be concerned with a way of life and a way of living and a direction of life. Uh, you know, that, that's Psalm 23 is about direction and, you know, a way of life. And, you know, God's leading in the wilderness is about a direction. Uh, you know, Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, Isaiah 35, you know, there was a way of holiness. So, so it's a way of living. And, and so much of the Bible is directed to finding that path and following it. And, and I think that falls really neatly into that, that idea of lead us not into temptation or, or lead us on the paths that, that you, uh, you, you want us to walk upon. You did talk about temptation. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's, uh, you, I think you hit it too. There's a way in which uh, lead us not into temptation is just putting in the negative, the, the more affirming, like take us where you will go. It's, it's uh, you know, Isaiah's here I am Lord. Mm -hmm. um, so here I am Lord is uh, a more affirming and way of saying lead us not into temptation. Uh, mm -hmm. It also probably makes for a better hymn than a <laughs> hymn titled lead us not into temptation. Yeah. That's going to only just be a, a part of the song. You know? <laughs> okay. Can't be a whole song by itself. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you say temptation is about assuming control over one's own life. I, 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 am I paraphrasing you correctly? That's fair enough. Sure. Yep. Um, I, I love that. Ex unpack that a little bit. What, so, so temptation is more than, and I think we just talked about it, it's more than just an action. There, there's more to this overcoming temptation than just overcoming solitary actions. Yeah, uh, it's a, a way of living open-handed and not closed-fisted in the world. Uh, it's a way of leaving yourself open to surprises uh, rather than a slave to a schedule. And by the way, 
I'm not saying this as if I am good at anything I'm saying right now, right? I mean, that's true for most sermons. Like, preacher Jeff is a far better Christian than the, you know, the the guy who's functioning the other 167 hours and 40 minutes out of the week. Um, but yeah, so, but I, I know the the destiny I want for my life, which is one that isn't constantly feeling as if I have to make my life for me or else I won't have one, but rather I get to receive everything as a gift. Because I really do think that's the, the relationship between uh, God and his creation is one of constant like gift giver, gift recipient. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean to learn how to be a good receiver over a good taker? That's good. Um, and I don't think, and I don't think we live in a society that teaches us that particularly well either. Right. No. Um, even though that we have other good gift givers in our lives that aren't God, you know, like call them like minor poets to God's major poetry. I mean, if you're lucky enough to come from a healthy family and whatnot, like you've been given other gifts, those moments should teach us in small ways what we're talking about here with God in big ways. Um, but still, I feel like the overwhelming message of the world is like, take what you need, take what you want. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so being led away from that temptation is, is really important. And, and assuming a posture of a, a recipient is, is really important to, to the life of faith. I keep thinking, I think, I think it's Augustine that says that the natural, the carnal nature is a nature that's bent towards oneself. Right. And I believe the regenerated and, and what, I, what I feel in my life, not that I don't screw up and sin and need to confess and ask forgiveness, but my bend is towards God, that that, that is the desire of my heart. Right. And so that's the other amazing thing is takers make terrible givers. Right. The only, the only reason they would become a giver is if they, through some twisted algorithm, thought that this was actually going to help them take more later on. Right. Uh, but receivers, people who just keep waking up and finding manna at their feet every single morning, they can be more generous people. They can live giving lives. They, they recognize they didn't take what they have. It was already a gift. And so they're able to then, uh, their lives doesn't bend back in on itself. Like Augustine says, it gets to, to look outward, both to God and neighbor. Uh, I think that's really important too. Now, in our, when, we, when we preach this week at the, the Nazarene Church, we talked a lot about fear, and, and when I heard you talking about temptation and self-preservation and self, uh, and, and we had a good conversation when we talked about um, our podcast, how, how does fear fit into the concept of temptation? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I think fear is an emotion that can become uh, a sinful action and I, I want to be clear for anybody that's watching this that I don't I don't think fear as an emotion is a sin I think God has given us all the emotions we experience uh, fear and and joy and disgust I think all of them have been given to us for a reason um, now in a sinful broken world and in sinful broken lives we can twist those reasons but I think all of them are created uh for a purpose which is glorifying god um but our fear does very quickly fear more than maybe many other emotions geez i'd even go so far as to say fear more than like lust can very quickly transform itself into a, a sinful action or at least a, a strong temptation to a sinful action um because it's, you know, I mean, I think I said in the, the sermon, I, granted, it was more under the uh, evil part, uh, the, the next part of the clause. But, you know, fear causes people to go out and buy up all the toilet paper, hoard all the toilet paper, and then turn around and go out and buy bullets with which to defend it. That's right. Um, and I'll be, I'm going to give credit here. That, that line comes from uh, pastor friend Ben Barris and Huntsville, Ohio. We we share our sermons with each other with another buddy, Jake, down in Texas, uh, and he wrote that line in there. And I went, "Yeah, that's the, that's that's what I was going for." There you go. There you go. Um, but yeah, it's true. Like we're seeing our we're seeing our community behave fear, not just 
feel fear. Right. Uh, I'm going to leave people to their feelings all day long. It's re- it's a ridiculous action to try to repress and suppress those. But when they're be- when we start behaving fear, we've probably already tripped past temptation and we're full on in sin. Mm, that's good. You, you said, um, and, and I, I'm going to look at your quote because I, I wrote this down. When God leads our macro movements in the world, take on the same character and or, yeah when god leads our macro movements in the world take on the same character and quality of our loving lord and i'm interested in why you chose the word macro here oh i uh some of that was an attempt at wit which uh the fact that you have to ask proves that the wit didn't land as opposed to the micro germ yes exactly that okay. was it. yeah it was uh talking about how this microscopic okay, I got um, has been creating such havoc and and how it's even caused me to take a microscope to my own life um but yeah uh, that was uh, that was the micro macro thing uh okay. i put those things out there i assume ben and jake are going to edit them out if they're terrible so if it doesn't land first presbyterian church saints i want you to know i don't <laughs> I take no blame for it. It is all Ben and Jake's faults. We will we'll publish their phone numbers here in post-production. You can call them and tell them, obviously, Jeff needs help. You, you um, mean you, you don't have a laugh track? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, that, that makes sense now because, you know, I'm thinking – I'm thinking econ one, econ two, micro and macro economics and small and big. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, isn't this about small steps? But, but it makes sense you're talking about it. It's the big move of God yeah. through his people uh, that can overcome even these, these uh, uh, microns or, uh, you know, the, the, the microscopic uh, disease that we're facing. So, okay. I'm right. Yeah. I mean, I, I am almost never using economic terms in a sermon. You see the books behind me. I was a lit major in college. Uh, I actually did use an economic term one time about three months ago. We have two, uh, we have this couple in the congregation who have masters in economics and I like ran it by them before I went up on, you know, the pulpit on Sunday and embarrassed myself. And they right. assured me I was saying it mostly right. Uh, to which I said, what do you mean by mostly? And they're like, don't worry about it. Uh, so I think I did mess up, but they, they only they knew. Uh, <laughs> so no, if you hear micro macro, I'm not talking economic terms. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, that, it, it's actually pretty funny now that I get it. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll laugh the rest of the day. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's a lie, but it's one that I'm going to cling to anyway. <laughs> you know, you talked about, and, and it was kind of in... Um, you're near your, you're the end of your sermon, you were talking about um, how the church shapes. You know, the church shapes, scripture shapes, prayer shapes. How does the church shape differently in times of separation? Oh, man, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the million-dollar question right now for us, isn't it? How, how can the church continue to shape us when we're not able to, to get together? Um, I mean, I got to tell you, I... I'm, I'm delighting in the fact that we are going through this at a time when we have so much technology, right? Mm-hmm. And I, even what you and I are doing right here, Paul, I mean, this is iron sharpening iron. This is continually allowing the spirit to, within the course of our conversation to mold us and form us into who we are, are supposed to be. And, and we're, we're doing this over Zoom. Uh, we're able to record it and then we're able to share this with our congregations and and the spirit can take hold of it uh, and do with them you know hopefully a good work Uh, so I don't think the church is rendered uh, by any means impotent when we're not able to gather together Um, and you know there's even been times in the church's history where some saints went off intentionally into solitude uh, typically to pray for the world you know, they, they weren't missionaries sent out to try to uh, proclaim good news and, and see good works done. They felt like they were called to an ascetic life where the best they could do is pray for the world. And that's another model that I'm clinging to right now, that all of us have had a little bit of asceticism forced onto us. Right. Uh, what's uh, Andy Crouch, I think, has the quote like, 
Uh, I didn't know I'd be giving up this much for Lent. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, we're all there. Um, and so I'm also hoping that the church remembers that in its big history, we've had folks who have left the fold for a season to pray for the whole world. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and they were formed and they became saints out of that even. And so that's another way that I think the church continues to form us. If, if we're going to be forced to part, let us take this extra time of solitude and separation to, to pray for the world. That's good. That's awesome. Um, you, How about you? How are you thinking about that in terms of your own congre- congregation and, and context there? I think we're having to be intentional. Uh, that, that we cannot rely upon a gathering, that, that we have to be intentional. And so uh, I'm encouraging my congregation to reach out and call at least seven people um, a week, call, not just text, and, you know, to, but to actually call and then let me know so that we make sure everybody's being covered. So I, I think it's, it, it could lead to a, a greater degree of intentionality as far as connecting with people and not relying upon the church gathering people, but that instead the church gathering itself. And so um, I, I think it could be a healthy corrective in that there's a lot of people that probably you consider your dear friends that you see once a week. Uh, well, why is that? You know, you, some of our closest friends are in the church and yet the only time we see them is in the church building and, and perhaps God is going to use this as a time for us to learn how to reach out in, in more, more effective and intentional ways. So, yeah. Well, and I'll say one other really surprising thing. So after we preached, uh, after we did a worship video for Sunday the 15th, two Sundays ago, I, I put it out on my personal Facebook page uh, in addition to the, the church's page. And I had a, a friend from when I was an RA at Kent State University. This was like in 2005. I haven't seen her in a decade and a half. And I saw that she shared my whole worship video. Uh, And I thought, well, that's, you know, and I I mentioned that, you know, at the beginning of this week's worship video. Um, And so I don't think I'm going to be a celebrity, but I I think the church is actually doing outreach uh, in this unique time. And, And it's not like if we had all been publishing these videos that, you know, she would have grabbed onto that, you know, back in December or whatever. I do think that this COVID-19 thing is scaring people and they're looking for certainty. They're looking for hope and good news. And of course, every worship service is going to be full of those. Um, definitely Nazarene worship services and probably most Presbyterian ones. Either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> Let me ask you, you ask me, was there something that you wish you would have talked about that you didn't or is there something that that you left on the cutting floor that 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 you wish you would have had time to include on on this sermon yeah i mean i i mentioned earlier and i i still wish i could have spent more time with that pillar of of smoke and fire and and allowing i see warmth in that imagery i i don't know I, I, I see the like the psalm that says that God hems us in from before and behind and that sort of thing that we're like encapsulated uh, in his love. I see a God who leads us day and night as doing the same sort of thing. Like I found a lot of comfort and security personally in that. And then it just, you know, didn't present itself or an opportunity for it didn't present itself in the sermon. And so you know, if, if I did the sermon differently, we might spend a lot of time there. Um, and I've also always been really drawn to, for whatever reason, that that story of Peter being reinstated and the idea of like having a belt put around his waist and being led. Again, I, I think I would have looked for, you know, other illustrative material, you know, from pop culture or news or whatever to, to help us understand what that meant because I think that's a really profound image too um so yeah I all I can hope is that you know congregation you know uh, and reading their scriptures the spirit enliven their own imagination around those images because I think they're really they're really vital uh and I look forward to hearing if anybody uh you know said I quit listening to what you were saying because I did get wrapped up in uh, that would be a fine thing as a pastor to hear. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, and I've enjoyed the conversation. And uh, thanks for uh, participating with me and on, on our podcast. And thanks for letting me participate 
in this. Yeah, and, and just so you know, uh, you Presbyterians who are, are watching this, and and my mom inevitably, hi mom, um, she loves that I've got everything online now. Uh, uh, Paul hi, and I, mom. <laughs> thanks. Uh, Paul and I did a recording just a few minutes ago where we kind of reversed roles. I spent more time asking him questions about his sermon, still had a nice conversation. So if you want to go and find his sermon on their web page and, and the conversation he and I had about it, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, part of what inspired Paul and I to do this is not just COVID-19. In fact, I don't even want to say it's primarily COVID-19. I think what inspired this is uh, a true collegial relationship here in Marysville, a, a commitment to seeing God glorified in and through our community, to see our the lives of our neighbors surrounded in God's love. And, and you know, we've been working at this in many other ways up to this point, uh, and we're just really excited to be working in that way now here. So, and in honor, by the way, of working with a Nazarene, as you can see, I've taken the Nazarite oath. Yes. Uh, it's not just because all the barbershops are closed, but, but I think until God rids our land of this plague, I'm just going to let the beard and the hair go. Yeah, uh, are you going to join me in that, Paul? That's what I I need. had to shave mine, so. For, uh, for the future, so, so. All right, well, Paul, thank you so much for taking time uh, to listen to my sermon, to prepare such good questions, to, to help me think through it a little bit more, and, and for the service that you're providing. Uh, First Presbyterian Church. Would you mind saying a, a prayer to close us out? Sure, let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity to gather and talk about your word. We're thankful that your word never returns void, but if we dive into it, Lord, you will bless it and use it. I pray your blessing on Pastor Jeff and on First Presbyterian, that you will bless this people, that you will use them. I pray for your blessing on our community, that we will be known as a community that loves one another, uh, that, that we're not defined by the signs on our doors, but we're so, is, we, we are defined uh, by your work in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless right. you. Well, see ya. See ya.